Good morning. Thank you all for coming out. I'm Rolando Garza. I'm the archaeologist and chief of resource management, both cultural and natural resources here at Palo Alto Battlefield. And for the longest time, I've been the only resource person, uh, except I can get a biotech uh, sometime in August. So it's exciting. By the way, today I'm going to talk about the archaeological investigations we've conducted on the four National Historic Landmark uh, designated battlefields here. Uh, three three Mexican-American War, U.S.-Mexican War, and the uh, Palmino Ranch, Last Battle Civil War. First, I'd say, what is archaeology? I got I got prizes for y'all too. Who <laughs> 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 can tell me what archaeology is? Study of something. <laughs> the study of something. That's good. <laughs> It's a study. All right, you got it. Here you go. All right. Watch out there. I started you off. Yeah. The study of past human cultures through the, uh, through the material cultural remains utilizing scientific method. That means what's left behind. You know, whatever's on the ground, like here at the battlefield, it's what survives. You know, I first got into archaeology um, excited about the prehistoric resources, about the cultures in in the Southwest and in here in Cameron County uh, before the Europeans came over. And uh, it's really cool. You know, a lot of people say archeology span is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle of the past. We're looking into a window trying to put together, but with prehistoric archeology, span we're missing a lot of the pieces of the puzzle. In historic archeology, span which, you know, it just happened. I love prehistoric, I still do. But most of my jobs have been in 19th century archaeology, uh, starting with uh, Friedman Cemetery up in Dallas, where we relocated over 1,100 burials back in the early 90s up there. And it was, uh, it was started in 1869 to about 1905. Uh, but the big difference, the historic record. You got a lot more information. Who can tell me what's wrong with that information, though? You got a lot. But what happens when you just when you got historic stuff? What is historic? What is the historic record to begin with? You have perspective. You have what? Bias, bias, and uh, agendas. Here, go, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you got a lot more information. You got a lot of more pieces of the puzzles, but they're not all accurate. You know, because people have it's just like here at the battle. You got people from the 5th Infantry and people from the 8th Infantry sending the reports in, you know, the commander sending the reports in, and then it's coming from there, they're the ones that carry the battle, they're, you know, they took all the heat, and so it comes with that. And then just imagine on, on the Mexican side. I like to tell, uh, I like to tell kids uh, when I do the living history out here, just imagine you and your brother or your sister get in a fight, and then your parents separate y'all and ask you to tell them what happened. Is it going to be the same story? No. <laughs> so that's what happens with the historic record. But it's so good. Like I said, it's so good because you have so many more pieces of the puzzle. You just got to wade through it all. You got to read. You got to read. Sometimes uh, working with some of my uh, the living history guys, they'll read a first-hand account and just take it for word. And no, no, no. You, you got to read others. You got to read them all if you can. And the archaeology is also, wait, the, it's a subdiscipline of anthropology, which is the scientific study of humans. And there are a lot of subdisciplines in there. But here is uh, the four battlefields we'll be talking about today. Uh, two are part of the National Park, uh, Palo Alto, Rosario de la Palma. Right now, there is legislation in the House put out by Filimon Vela. Uh, to bring Fort Brown into Palo Alto, which is good because there's standing ruins out there. There's remnants of the 1846 fort that General Zachary Taylor built when he came down here in the spring of 1846. And it's, what's amazing, he came down here in the spring of 1846 with half of the standing U.S. Army, which is only about 5,000 troops. And then after these battles took place, uh, um, after these battles took place, he would be inundated with over 70,000 volunteer troops. But before Taylor came, 
United States annexed Texas under uh, President James K. Polk. And Polk, as a senator, was always pushing to get California and New Mexico territories into the United States. So he came with one agenda, westward expansion. Uh, he was a pretty successful president. But anyway, and y'all know the story of the Texas Revolution in 1836 and all that. And with the signing of the Treaty of, uh, of uh, Velasco, uh, Texas claimed all of this. The New Republic of Texas claimed all this boundary. Meanwhile, during the colonial and the Young Republic of Mexico, this was always the boundary of Texas. So in 1845, when it came uh, to term, when the U.S. was pressuring Mexico to negotiate and, and accept this boundary, there's no way a Mexican president could accept any terms or deal with the U.S. and stay in office. Uh, so war is kind of inevitable. You know, in, in the summer of 1845, uh, Polk sent Taylor and half the troops, half the army, to Port Isabel, I mean, to Corpus Christi, and they wintered over there. And then in the spring, they marched down and, and came by sea to, uh, to set up a base on the, op on the north banks of the Rio Grande. And this is this kind of look. Conocitos was uh, the initial skirmish. They, were, they started in March building this fort uh, uh, opposite of Matamoros. Um, and in April 25th, uh, you know, meanwhile, of course, Mexico is amassing troops in the, the Army of the North in Matamoros. And in late April, uh, they send Mariano Arista, General Mariano Arista, to take command. And he has a, a, a regiment of, uh, of uh, cavalry or lancers come and they, and they capture uh, a scouting party of dragoon, U.S. dragoons of Conocitos. And they killed seven and took the rest captured back to Mexico. And that is what Polk would use to, in, in Congress to get war declared. But that didn't happen until May 10th after these battles had already been fought. But meanwhile, for Mexico, you remember the map I just showed you with the disputed turn? Once the US Army crossed the Nueces River, they were on their soil. They, so they were already at war. It was, the U.S. Army had initiated the war already by coming on their soil. And I'd also like to say, uh, you know, the people down here, because this was not unoccupied territory. The people were, that were down here in 1845, in the spring of 1846, the people living down there, were Mexicans. They were affiliated with Mexico. They were not Texans, in their opinion. Okay, so this is, Actually, this is a period lithograph. Most of them are really stylized, but this one's pretty good. It's fairly accurate, except for the mountains in the back. But, uh, <laughs> but that gives you a pretty good picture of what it would have looked like behind the US lines during the battle. And uh, the other good thing about the historic record is we know we have the order of battle from both armies. And we know kind of how it went, but like I said, you got the historic record, and there's a lot of bias and a lot of movement. Archaeology helps you get to a more accurate picture of the past because the, archae the archaeological record is not biased. It's deposit. How you, it, it's how it, it is. It's what's left behind. It's what happened. It's the true evidence. Sometimes it can be impacted by people collecting or by uh, earth moving or something like that, but the archaeological record is an accurate, help you help you wade through and get to a more accurate picture of, of the past. And I say, so that's what I got out. Actually, I would like, I should adjust, I should have adjusted this before this presentation, but the, based on the archeology, span the two initial lines uh, should be cocked a little bit about 10 degrees uh, to be more stacked. You'll see when we get to the end of the Palo Alto presentation. But a record, we have it, you know, why, why, you know, we know what happened, why do we want, we want to get a better picture so we can interpret this battle better to the public. Uh, we do have this, maps and all that, but they don't match up with the modern topographic maps, especially this one here. We see that long ridge over there, on, on the corner over there, and uh, that kind of caused uh, earlier site designations 
The purple is a state site. The, the orange is a National Historic Landmark boundary. And then the red is the, the park boundary. And see, down there, in the early call, part of what happened, why they extended down there, not just because of that previous map, but uh, during the beginning of the 20th century, uh, troops from uh, Fort Brown would use this as artillery range. So their shrapnel was a lot of small little lead balls. So it kind of confused the thing. But in 92, Charles Eckert from the Park Service came down and did a preliminary reconnaissance survey uh, to kind of pinpoint, identify for sure, this is uh, the core battlefield area in this new boundary. Which Charlie is a good friend and he's participated in every year uh, of the work we've done down here. So, 2004, we opened this building. Um, and we had a trail going out to the Overlook. But wide array, there was pressure to add more trails, add more trail system. And to do that, any federal action, you got to comply with the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, which it just states any federal action, you need to see what the effects on cultural resources are. So I, they were calling for me to do archaeological survey of the project areas. But I convinced the superintendent, rather than let the trail where people want to put the trail designate where we do the archaeology. Let's do the archaeology first and let the archaeology designate where we put the trails. So we, on, on, uh, on base funding, you get $20,000, $20,000, dollars the first three years, which isn't much. I was applying for real project money, which didn't come until 2010. Uh, but we were able to get a start and actually direct where the, where the Mexican line and the U.S. line trails uh, went in. But I, uh, I had to grid this off, I put a 200 meter grid over the park like that so we can checkerboard this and get as much information as rapidly as we can. Uh, and to do an archaeological survey, the vegetation looks like this, but you need it to look like this. So you can get your metal detector and it goes evenly swing over the ground to get good depth and, and you have more consistency and what you're finding. And I could have sworn I had pictures of my, my buddy who did the mowing for many years, Roy De Los Santos, he was a longshoreman, but this is the only one I found out there. But he was a great guy. I, you know, there was a couple of times where I was kind of pressured to try a different mower because they said, why are you just giving him all the money, all the business? But he, I could stake out the, the survey quads and I never had to go back and check. I don't know, the other mowers, they would always get confused and go out. Roy, Roy was a great guy. But he eventually retired. He was too hard on his back, he said, running on the tractor. Uh, it was good. And uh, so he, he'd always leave it very good. He was, he was great. I don't know if it was just his equipment but, or his concentration. It was very good. And also with times when there were more woody surveys, Fish and Wildlife helped me out with his gyro track, which would shred the woody vegetation down to the ground level without causing uh, ground disturbance. So this is, uh, this is what it looks like. <laughs> of course, some of it got sloppy with the cactus. This is, this is as ideal as the other one. But you, you got to work with what you get. Right, John? Yes. Let's <laughs> uh, we'll see if John, did you see yourself? You, John. Yeah, John was also participated in every survey I've done on uh, every battlefield. Thanks a lot, John. I really appreciate that. Uh, there's Charlie down here, and I, I do, I really do try and get uh, students involved. This is part of the UT Pan American uh, uh, Anthropology Club uh, out there, Robin and Maria, and, you know, just get them hands-on experience, but also help them, you know, help them, you know, decide if this is really what they want to do. That's Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so I did this in partnership with where I used to work. My first permanent job at the Park Service was the Southeast Archaeological Center. And so they would come down and help because, you know, you can never, I'm the archaeologist here, but you cannot do anything alone. You need partners, you need mentors, uh, you need friends, you know, and volunteers like, like John. 
So we did it with a partnership with SEAC. The archaeologists would come down. We used uh, the methodology that Doug Scott uh, created back in the 80s when he did the Battle of Little Bighorn. And Doug Scott also participated in this, uh, in these uh, projects. Uh, and then we partnered with uh, Cultural Resource GIS out of Washington and, uh, and the volunteers. So we collect, we, we search for every metal hit, uh, iron, iron as well, anything period uh, we would collect. Uh, modern stuff, we would uh, put in a general collection. We would collect and remove it from the battlefield, but we put it in a general collection. So we'd have these archaeologists from SEAC uh, with bags and follow, and we'd get pinpoint convenience using uh, GPS equipment, Trimble, uh, which <coughs> GPS is and really, all the technology has really accelerated, and it's so accurate nowadays. Back then, when we first started, like 2005, we were probably getting this accuracy with this. Nowadays, it's easy to get 10 centimeter or below accuracy. And then every day, so we have these bag, bag taggers. They would start their own end of this, because we'd have about four or five, because we have big crews going out there. And so they'd have their own end of this, but at the end of each day, we'd have to sort it and create one field specimen log and check. And that way we could also check that night uh, with the GPS uh, data. Okay, I thought it wasn't me. <laughs> I, I forgot to turn my phone off. Uh, and we could check with the GPS data and make sure we didn't miss anything. Uh, we would put metal pins in the ground, metal flag pins in the ground uh, with the numbers. And when they, when they, recorded it, they would bend it. But sometimes they, the GPS guys would miss it, so we could go back and we leave them in the field, we leave them in the field till after we're sure we got all the points, and then we remove them, because we don't want to add trash, especially metal trash, to, uh, to the site, because it's an archeological record. And also, I was gonna say also, luckily, there was a big gap in, there was the battle, some 19th century stuff, uh, maybe associated with the Civil War, and there's a big gap of nothing until you get to the late 20th century. And uh, the metal artifacts, what were they, John? Well, we From the late 20th century, what did we find? When you didn't get battle stuff, I'll just say it. We got beer cans yeah. and <laughs> shotgun shells. <laughs> so we know what they did out here in the late <laughs> latter part of the 20th century. <laughs> but we put all this in a database. We have an all database which we can hook up to our GIS. But I'm going to veer away. Uh, okay. And this is after six seasons, we covered 100% of the battlefield that the Park Service owns. We still need to get this. We have pretty much acquired all of this. And this has the eastern part of the battlefield, which includes the final Mexican line and the camp and hospital where the Mexican soldiers uh, after the battle. And these are, thank you, Karen. Where's Rubens? Okay, no, <laughs> I thought it was an anime on my slides. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, when I first showed the lithograph of the battle, there was supposed to be a cannon fire in there. I was kind of disappointed it didn't happen. <laughs> okay, thank you, Karen. I thought for sure you were going to turn off everything. <laughs> Here you go, Karen. I'll give you a prize. <laughs> No time. No time for it. <laughs> uh, okay. So these, okay. I would say at least 90 to 94% of this are battle related artifacts. The rest are period or, or something else, something of interest that, I would, that, I, that we collected. The other thing, we collected all coins. I don't know, that was a policy that my boss at SEAC had, and he, he was down here, he's my partner, Kofi I. We just collected all coins all the time. I don't know why. <laughs> so I got we got modern pennies as well as as period stuff. But Palo Alto can be characterized as an artillery duel. So the predominant artifact are 
artillery munitions. These are the one thing that separates. Uh, so when I worked at SEAC, it was a great experience because I got to work on Revolutionary War battlefields, War of 1812 battlefields, and Civil War battlefields, including Shiloh, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, and Stones River, which is really cool. What sets the Mexican War apart? The Mexicans were using copper, copper ammunition, copper cannonballs, that, because it was a surplus metal from their civil, civil mines. Uh, but we didn't find a lot of these. I'll show you later in another graphic. And we didn't find, there's also, I'll, I'll kind of get into that later. But yeah, artillery was a, do, artillery munition was a dominant artifact, battle related artifact that we found. This is the same cannonball before, before and after conservation. It's iron, it's an iron shot. The copper was a four pound, this is a six pound uh, cannonball. All right, I have a question. How did they, how did they gauge or label their, their cannons, their artillery back then? The US had eight to 18 pound cannonball, cannons that they brought up. They weren't really meant, they were meant to take the fort ground as a siege, but since, uh, since Taylor had them, we brought them up and used them. And then they had a, flying, a new uh, strategy of flying artillery developed by Major Samuel Ringgold who would die from wounds received at the battle. And the US, the Mexican army had four pounders and eight pounders. So how did they gauge the, the artillery? <laughs> Here, wait, you can have, you can have the present. Oh wait, I got <laughs> nothing but dinosaurs. <laughs> by the by, weight by of, the weight of the shot. By the weight of the solid cannonball. But there were three main types of, of ammunition. They had solid cannonball. I mean, this technology old, it's very simple. And you have a, you have a, a tube, a barrel, you have, a, you need uh, explosive material, a powder charge, and you put your projectile in there, and you set off the powder charge, it just goes out. We were used, they're using smooth bore barrels back then. Uh, they had three types, solid cannonball, spherical case, which is a hollowed out cannonball with lead and gunpowder in it, and they used uh, uh, paper cotton, cotton fiber, or linen kind of uh, uh, treated in slow match uh, uh, fuses that they stuck in there, stuck in through the fuse that they had, uh, that would go off, that would ignite when the fire, when the explosion there would come around and light the fuse. And actually this methodology was a lot better. The, the new technology in the Civil War was the Borman fuse, which was mercury where you punch it for how many seconds you want. Here you would cut the, cut the length of the fuse to how many seconds you want to burn. I've never found an unexploded ordinance here at Palo Alto or, or at, for the Mexican War. In the Civil War, we found them all the time. Just, they're you know, live rounds. And uh, actually, people have gotten killed trying to defuse them themselves, or, or clean them, or whatever. But this is a body of a spherical case shot. And then we had numerous uh, canister shot out there, which is essentially, so the spherical case hollowed out cannonball with gunpowder and, and balls lit balls in there and exploded in air grain shrapnel. The other one was a canister shot. It was either made out of hardened hide or, or a can, and it had balls in there, a lot of balls. So it turned, essentially turned uh, the cannon into a big shotgun. It's meant for close range, very effective on artillery charge, infantry charge, because it puts a lot of metal out in the air. And we had, uh, we had, we found copper, and lead canister shot in their wells besides iron. All right, here, let me get some better prizes because I'm gonna start asking y'all questions. <laughs> okay, who can tell me what this is? <laughs> I know, I just, you want another pig? <laughs> Hello, Jonathan, I got a lot of dinosaurs. What's that? Drink? Yes, it's a gun flip. Use the, use the tire. Here you go, Mary. <laughs> uh, yeah, so back then, okay, percussion caps were already out and about, but Taylor wanted his troops to have the flintlock muskets uh, because they were tried and true, they knew how to use them. Uh, and so we found that this would be an English source flint. The Mexican Army was also using flintlock. They had the, the third... Uh, 
pattern India, India rifle from the brown best uh, musket from England that they got on surplus. Uh, England is getting rid of there was they cleaned them on, they claimed them unserviceable. Uh, so the Mexican army got them, you know, which, you know, the, the Mexican army fought, they were valiant, they fought well, they resisted all the way to the capital of Mexico. Uh, but they were just not supported well. They were ill-equipped. They weren't supported as well as the U.S. Army was. I'm ready. Okay, what's this one? Any ideas? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a roll from a spell. Yeah, you, you gotta take a dinosaur. Or, like, I know I'll give you a. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Hey, if I, if I don't give it to y'all, they'll just stay in my office. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about this? That sign played off of a Indian Patterns brown dress. All right, wait. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I know Wade, Wade, Wade's a good friend of mine. Uh, he hasn't participated in the archaeology, but him and I together, I couldn't have done it. When I was back in interpretation, we started the Living History program back in 2005. Wade, Wade's a great guy. He did a great talk on the Texas Rangers. So yeah, so you have your lock mechanism for your musket. It goes in, and that's the plate on the other side where you screw it in and holds it in place. All right, how about this way? <laughs> it's a musket part. Any guess? This is hard. Uh, it's, a, it's a nose cap on the end of the wood, right on the barrel. It's where the wood ends out there. Keeps the wood from splitting. Okay, somebody at least guess on this one. Do you know this way or no? I'm going to try to determine the size. Uh, yeah, it's hard. So it's about that round. No, it's it's made out of kind of lead and pewter, which which it's used. <laughs> it shouldn't have been made out of lead. Uh, it's, like a, it's, it's a spout? it's a spout from a canteen. Lead? <laughs> oh wow! Okay, how about this? And that's hard. This is hard to make because it's a two dimensional bird. Okay. Is it flat on the back? Or no, it's it round. It all the way? It's round. Um, I'll just tell y'all. It is the mouthpiece from a bugle. Oh. Okay. I, man, I, you were there when we found it, right, John? I don't believe so. Oh, okay. This guy Chuck, my buddy Chuck from SEAC, who's now in Denver, he got so excited. He just, ah, I found it. Because as part of the battle, uh, the Mexican had, you know, their their band there doing a play. The U.S. Army focused on it and hit them and just chucked it. Oh, we found the band. We found where the band is. <laughs> Check with the band. That's a good, that's a big thing. You got to have a lot of fun when you work. It's hard work. Okay, I know Wade knows this too. <laughs> Although it might be hard. It's uh, it is the 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 top of a brush. Yeah, yeah, the army because these fouls, the black powder would foul your muskets all the time. So you have to clean your vent oh, and all that. The, the the whisk, yeah, the wrist brush, yeah. So on a little chain, the the soldiers would have one with a little pick at the end, like a little uh, toothpick, but metal, and then a little brush to clean out the pan. Okay, this is also difficult. It is part of four stack. That's good. Damn, wait. <laughs> What's the code name of the code set? Code code uh, okay, there's also something else. I didn't see it first, but is y'all know what a fija or an ica is? It's an old comes from the old world, Spanish and Italian. It's a charm to ward off evil spirits. It's a, it's a fist like that. And you can see it, they, they, they could bet me that that's what these are. But they'd have them all, although the Mexican lancers had them all on, the, on their tack on the horses. Okay. 
this. All right, Adrian, you got to say something. <laughs> Here, I got to give you one of these anyway. <laughs> it's also from a horse, from horse tax. It is the bottom. Yeah, the bottom of the from the Mexican army. And we know that because the U.S. Army had hollowed out stirrup bottoms. What's it made from? Uh, brass, copper. Uh, all right, go ahead, Mary Lou. What's that? <laughs> What'd you say? That? <laughs> <laughs> That's U.S. Yeah. Okay. What's that? Yeah. No, it's a, on your cartridge box plate. It's a, it's an eagle. It's a U.S. sign. What's that? <laughs> it's a four, number four. It's for the Fourth Regiment of uh, Mexican Infantry. Is that the belt buckle or the cross belt? I think it's a cross belt. Yeah. And this would have been on the hat, Sixth Infantry, Mexican. That's uh, just a belt buckle in there. Robert. Robert found half of this in the 90s when he worked with Charlie. And then he came back and he found the other half when, in our project 20 years later. <laughs> then these are the, these are the, these would have been for the unit, for Mexican soldiers. Uh, out there, you can look at the uniforms out there. We have that little display with the mannequins out there. You can see the uniform type. And this is uh, the U.S. Soldier with a D, denoting that they're the dragoons. We had A for artillery and I for infantry as well. These are musket parts of the ramrod guys before and after conservation. All right. Um, Bill, what is that? <laughs> That's what I know. Y'all are never going to come get Nora, you have to tell me that. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's the back of a watch. It's a watch. Here you go, Bill. I'll give you one anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. And they're not flipping you off. Okay. <laughs> Although it does look like that, right? Yeah. Okay, any idea what it is or, or what the symbol is? Well, that's that charm you were just talking about. Yeah, it's a, a fiha. Oh. But it's a watch fob. Oh, okay. Religious medallion, I believe that's out there in that display out there. And this is cool. This is one of my favorite artifacts. Uh, this is an 1841 Seat of Liberty. We found it right behind uh, the 18 pound where we are on the road, on the, on the historic road. We found artillery button and this kind of very close to each other where, uh, where the 18 pounders we believe were at. That's kind of cool. You can't see, I, I think I have a better example of a, of a Seat of Liberty dying than this. You can almost picture somebody looking for that afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, a dime was worth a hell of a lot more back then. <laughs> well, they get paid like eight bucks a month or... But, aside, like I said, aside from from the battle-related artifacts, we did find some stuff. This is an archaic projectile point, probably about uh, four or 5,000 years. We found it on the surface, because we're doing metal detector looking down, we found it on the surface it wasn't deposited uh, during the archaic period there. It was a Manny point. Somebody brought it here. It could be a late prehistoric person or something, but we found it on the surface. This modern surface kind of stabilized much later than that. So, But it's still cool. And we, did, I, we do have some prehistoric sites out here. All right. Young lady in the purple sweater. What is this? Is this okay? Tell me, tell me yes or no. I'll give you a yes or no question. Is this battle related or not? Is it battle related or not? All right, here you go. FPS Argyle. 
It is, uh, now it is a mini ball. It is a conical bullet. It's the back end is hollowed out. It's uh, for rifling. They have it hollowed out so when the explosion hits, it expands and it grabs the rifling. Because what did I say about the black powder? It fouls the musket. So you need to load it quicker. You need it to go in and uh, or go out. So so uh, so it expands and grabs the rifling and expands. So you get a lot more accurate fire. Okay. Any idea on this? It is the fuse head from uh, the artillery rounds at the fort we're seeing right before World War One. It's a French model uh, 75. So that, that's a fuse that would tell it when to go off. And that's enough of this show and tell. Uh, so we have it. everything in the database that we collect that we can connect to GIS, and so we can come out, tease them, because we're looking for the patterns to kind of discern how everything unfolded and what went down. Uh, so, we can plot. Just, uh, <laughs> this is copper canister versus iron canister. And I was telling you about the, you can see these, these kind of patterns in here, and kind of these, and that's why I said I, uh, we need to kind of change the flags out there, kind of cock it, pivot it a little bit uh, to, to be more accurate. Uh, and that's still, that's just kind of saying that, just different tools, different tools, different uh, programs that we use to tease out the data and show the line, show the patterns out there. Uh, this is cool. We, this, this, that's a, a canister shot. When we first, the first few years, I was taking my artifacts to, uh, to uh, Texas A&M to conserve it. I'm not disparaging them. It was the technology back then. And I'd come back, they, we pull them out of the ground like that, and unstable, and I'd come back with like just a little core of the ball because that was the only good metal. But later on, SIAC uh, Conservator kind of developed this method. This is cool because you have a better accurate of, of the artifact. The other one's kind of, you can't study that because it's just the heart of it. It just, it, it took away a lot of the information you can get. Because our, our collection, this record we have here, and it's a research collection open to researchers. So you said it. The problem is that needs continual treatment. You can't just leave it there. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's not totally stabilized. And these are some surfer maps. Like I said, discerning the pattern. That's distribution of iron canister by count and weight. Uh, lead shot uh, by count and weight. Uh, unfired lead. Which helps, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of the unfired lead, dead soldiers, they hit the ground, and their cartridge box there, and it, everything, everything uh, deteriorates and goes. It's just a metal artifact to say, especially in this environment, because we're coastal. This area used to flood. Right now it's flooded. <laughs> I wouldn't go out there because the mosquitoes are bad. But uh, right now they're standing water. But during the 19th century, we, this whole area of flood, we in the beginning of, but this is for my cultural landscape talk, uh, changing the hydrology by man, man activities, mainly all the drainage network that we had, that we started in 1912, uh, and the damming of the Rio Grande River has changed. The, the, it is, the delta does not act like it did before. Okay. Um, these are the big columns. So that would... Uh, That'd be English, the English or the Mexican Browns, that size caliber. And cannonballs. <coughs> These are solid cannonballs. Uh, we have a lot, there's a lot more canister out there in spherical case cannonball. Ooh. What do y'all think's wrong with that pic with this picture? We got copper and iron cannonballs. I'll just tell y'all. <laughs> <laughs> we should have more copper cannonballs. What happened is, you know, uh, this place, what the, okay, like I said, it worked at Shiloh. Uh, Shiloh was one of the five battlefields, Civil War battlefields that was protected since the 1899. This one wasn't protected and really until we came out. Uh, uh, and so during the 70s and 80s, people out here collect, even people that 
helped us to become a park would come out and copper cannonballs are cool or one and so there'd be some the other thing we have a dearth uh, impact in the archaeological record which that we got to understand i do i have i've had uh, interviewed a lot of people who came out here in the 80s to get that information uh but the uniform insignias the brass artifacts they don't want iron they don't want, you can only have so many iron cannonballs or canister shot and they're going for the high grade the, the stuff the stuff that you want to put on your shelf or so and so that you got to understand that we're not dealing with a pure archaeological record it's, and, but that's all archaeology something always impacts the archaeological record it's very rare that you get something pristine That's uh, I'll talk about that later. That's that's a uh, Mexican uh, uh, Lancers Regiment of Cavalry. Okay, here's that better example of the seat of liberty dying. What year is that? Well, that might be that might be post. That might be fifty nine. But these are all the coins. Like I said, we collect every coin that we that we find out there. There's only a couple that were that were buried. This is both uh, out there. Um, this is military buttons. Uh, these are all these buttons are all, all uh, battle related. And then, like I said, so with this information that we got, we're able to kind of discern the initial lines and the final lines of the battlefield. This is roughly the road. I didn't draw it well on this. I have a, I have a better, this is an old map. I, I should probably get a better one. Uh, but on the road, you can see traces, especially in old aerial photographs. But I remember Chuck, my buddy Chuck, every time we had a survey quad, actually you could see, so this is an old aerial too, you could see some of the, the scars from us doing archeology span right there. Uh, which you can't see anymore, they wipe it because the vegetation comes back. Uh, but he said anytime we had a survey quad that crossed the road, he said we're going to find uh, a mini ball, which we did. We always found the Civil War, just because there was a lot of activity during the Civil War out here on all the roads, all the coast, all that, you know. It went back and forth between the, the, the Union and Confederate back during the day, this, this area. So that's it for the Battle of Paul Walton. Let's move on to Versace Little Paula. This is a period map. Uh, um, it's weird. This is the only one where the north is facing down. So I'll, I'll kind of correct that and talk about that. And this is what we own right now, a modern of the 34 acre park of what we had right now, which is our second unit. These are them together. Uh, so the Americans at Paul Walter's artillery duel, neither side gave up the field of battle. Uh, they ceased fire at, at dusk, which was customary back then, but the Mexican army fared a lot worse because of the American artillery. So before dawn, uh, General Arista moved his troops uh, down. Oh, that's what I wanted to show you. Let me go back a minute. Sorry, I said I was gonna leave Paul Walter, but I'm um, down here, this is the part of the exit route going out that the Mexican armies took before dawn coming out. We were wondering why those scattered out there. And this is part of the, of the Mexican um, cavalry charge to try and outflank, the initial one to try and outflank them. But like I said, I am certain we, uh, we got all of the core battlefield up there and we just need to get it to the east. West. I'm sorry for going back. I have no idea what time is it. Y'all are all good, right? Okay. Uh, so, this is the battle. The roads coming in over here. What happened is, it was a good plan to negate the effects of the American artillery. He wanted to use a, the natural ravine and dense brush to cancel out the American artillery, the, the flying artillery and the, and the 280 powder. It worked. Rosaka de la Palma could be characterized as hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was a lot more even, but what happened is these Mexican troops over here did not engage in battle. They were holding their position. 
they heard the conflict, they're waiting for the Americans to engage them, uh, and they visibly, when you're in this dense brush like we have back over here, you can't see. And so they just held their position while the American army concentrated on the western flank, and after two hours of intense fighting, they were able to capture uh, the, the penetrate and capture the Mexican camp and send the Mexican army in a full out retreat, which would also relieve the siege of Fort Brown, which had been under siege uh, since May the 3rd. And this is on the afternoon, or the afternoon of May the 9th. So the road would have been further west of the current corridor. Yeah, the, the fort is in the same place, but it would have been hugging, it would have come down like here, hugging that. Uh, so, we did archaeology, we even did metal detector survey out there. This is, uh, we did a metal detector survey out there, we found one musket ball over here, and then we found uh, uh, replica stuff from a reenactor's camp in 2008 <laughs> in there. But, uh, the city, the city actually was our partner for a while, uh, and they, uh, they owned the property, then they sold it to the Brownsville Community Foundation, uh, um, which we ended up buying, which uh, Mary, Mary Julia was uh, involved in this and a great donor, great friend of the park, and she and Frank were instrumental in helping the first park to get established in 78, the first legislation, and the 1992 legislation as well, and getting this building here. Okay, so we found one musket ball. I knew in the 50s this was a citrus orchard, and then in the 60s, uh, the Adonias made it into a pole field. And so I, I wanted to test the integrity of the land for them. The city had money, it was still their property, and they, uh, they got a grant and to do archeology. span we, we, uh, we hired PBS and J consultants, and we did shovel testing and backhoe trenching to test so we could really see the impact. And there was some fill, a lot of fill brought in and just reworked, but, there's still, if there was archaeological, if there was battle stuff here, if we would have seen it in places, but we didn't. So that just goes to show, um, I'll just go back one slide. Oh, yeah, I'll move forward. Oh, yeah, I'll move back. It, it, because the heat of the battle was over here, I want to say also in 1967, they found a mass burial of Mexican soldiers out here when they were digging this out to build this residential area. Uh, graduate students from University of Texas uh, came out and uh, uh, and did that. Supposedly there were more, but that supposedly there were other burials out there that they encountered. But because it took so long and stopped the construction, they didn't get reported. I can't. I have no proof of that, and I won't even say who the builder is. But. This is why, even though it wasn't the heart of the battle, it's still important to preserve because it is part of the battlefield. Mexican troops are out here. Um, and that is a vestige, you know. Why do we want to preserve these sites? Yeah, I'll give you three pins in red tone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's my opinion. This is my opinion why we want. It's important. These about, okay, and I don't know what, uh, what started here would lead to event, would lead to the U.S. Army for the first time occupying a foreign capital. <coughs> what started here would forever change the face of the North American continent with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and Mexico ceding over half of its national territory to the U.S. and it forged the relationship between these two young republics. You know, Mexico got its independence from Spain in 1821. Uh, they had some type of weird false monarchy put in place until about 1823 when they adopted a constitution kind of mirrored after the U.S. Um, so they were trying to be a republic like the U.S. There were two young, two young nations growing. Uh, the problem is the colonial experiences were greatly different. And that's, that's a whole other talk that probably I shouldn't be giving. But this society, it's not, but this unit provides us with an opportunity to reach out to the community and provide a safe place. You know, we do living history out here. We also do it out there. We do it out here, but uh, 
what's one thing we've seen out here uh, during living history uh, that makes it not so safe for getting a lot of people out here? Wait. <laughs> What do you mean? Rattlesnakes. We have rattlesnakes all over. Yeah, you got to be careful. Kids can't just run wild out. And then everything's thorny. It's, this is much, a much more safer place to have events like this. This is our memorial illumination. We had it many years. I loved it. It was, uh, it was a lot of work. This year, we're hoping to do, we gotta, we're going to bring it back. We haven't done it for the past two years. Pandemic's part of the reason, but not all the reason. Because uh, this is hard on the staff. It, it, and I think it was the way the person who used to be in charge of it did it. So we're trying to devise a new, we're gonna do something this November, uh, probably Saturday after Veterans Day. We don't know why yet. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. Hopefully people continue to get vaccinated and the pandemic is not bad and we can all meet in person. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm hoping we don't get canceled because we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a big archeology span We got new, we do archeology span in October, Memorial, which is over here, and Memorial Illumination in November. And I got people, I got more archaeologists coming down from around the state. So I'm really hoping we don't get shut down from in-person events. Oh, that would be awesome. What, Sorry. getting shut down from in-person events? No! <laughs> 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 Structure map from 1846 on the fort. It's a six. It's a star-shaped, six-pointed. Uh, I'm not saying that right. Anyway, it's an earthen fortification. You can see these two have the the cross sections of it. That's the Sally Fort. It was never completed. Uh, the fort. Oh, uh, after Conocitos on April 25th, Taylor knew he was in a. They were ready. Conflict was imminent, immediately imminent, I guess. Um, I'll put it in this face. Um, and so he, um, on May 1st, he went to Port, to Port Isabel where they had a supply depot and they, were getting, they set up Fort Polk over there and they're getting, he went to go, he left 500 troops here under the command of Major Jacob Brown to finish construction of the fort and hold it at all costs until he come back with supplies. He went to support his bell, and they said he could hear on May the 3rd and May the 4th, they could hear the far off cannon firing on the fort from Port Isabel out there. Anyway, I forgot what I was going to say. On May the 7th, Taylor came back with about 3,500 troops and 300 wagons of supplies and two 18 pounders. They were intercepted at Phil Pier and Palo Alto. And we're going down, y'all heard about Rosaka and Fort Brown, this Fort Brown. So this part of the fort, as far as you know, was not completed. It's, it's kind of sketchy, the evidence, uh, what we have in the historic record. Um, but that's a pretty good drawing. It shows uh, what it is. The plaza, the cathedral, if you go, if you go visit Fort Brown right now, you can still see in different vantage points, the vegetation kind of high. But you still see the two spires from the cathedral that was standing in 1846. And then this is a modern aerial with those, the river shifted some. Uh, this is what the footprint, this is a, an 18 pound, a little lunette, uh, a little earthen battery that they put there to put two 18 pounders to protect the soldiers as they were constructing the fort. Uh, we did some remote sensing, and uh, actually a graduate student from UTPA did some remote sensing on uh, ground penetrating radar, and there looks like there's some surface, subsurface integrity out there. So this looks like it would be on the U.S. side. You know, I told y'all that uh, that there's legislation in Congress. Hopefully, uh, it, hopefully it will pass. And this. This comes to the park. This definitely warrants. They're standing ruins. They're standing much more than here. We're, we're in some play field. Up there, you can see something tangible that was left from 1846. I think really helps grab you, uh, grabs people's attention. 
So this is the track IBWC is willing to transfer it to us, but we have to have legislation passed before we can accept it. And then it would also be like we, we welcome birders here. We have a lot of nice birding here and just a different variety of birds out there. And it's a abandoned golf course. There's still all the infrastructure, all the trails, it, it, you know, it's going to be hard because it's south of the of the flood control levy and the border wall. Well, actually, there's a fence right now. Well, we don't have the real border wall there, uh, thanks to UT Brownsville. Uh, we have a co compromised fence, uh, so it'd be hard to spend a lot of money because of that. And that's why Congress is maybe a little leery on uh, the park service. But there's so much infrastructure already there that it wouldn't have the best. But like I said, there's standing ruins right there, and these battles, this, these resources down here, like I said, are important. Back to why do we want, because it makes us who we are as a country, both of our forged relationship. It's like a, like a person. Everything that's happened to you in your life is the impact of who you are today. Same thing with a country and societies. Everything that the society went through makes you who you are today. So anyway, uh, this is what it looked like back in, in 2010. This was the end of the driving range. Right now it's abandoned, it looks hardly old grown. But this is part of the wall, right there. That's part of the wall. You can really see it. 2011, uh, I got uh, the NPS uh, Midwest Archaeological Center puts on this archaeological prospection training where they use all sorts of remote sensing training. I went to the class up in North Dakota in 2010, and so I got them down. It was, it's all, like I said, all about partnerships, efficiency. So just for the cost of getting uh, getting the, the education material and paying for the travel of the teachers, uh, we're able to do get a lot of data on that and show Just a field again. Oh, let me show you this. Let me go back real quick. Okay. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Okay, you see this cannon here? Y'all familiar with the cannon at the corner? And what? Okay, those were placed in 1960 by the Fort Brown commander, Commander Parker, to commemorate the four. Make some more battlefields. This is the only one still in its original interment. All the others have been lifted, moved out. I have pictures from Robert Runyon showing the one at Palo Alto with the muzzle facing the sky to denote a U.S. soldier lost his life in battle here. It was out here somewhere on the old road, uh, but now they got moved over here. The one at Rosario de la Palma got moved the second time, and now after 2019, the summer 2019, it is inside our park unit there. But uh, yeah, that's. Those were all from 1916. So we hosted it. Uh, so we surveyed it, using remote sensing. We used uh, three main pieces of equipment. This is ground penetrating radar. This is what we thought was gonna give us the best information. Uh, we wore, they gave us some, but not exactly right. That is my good buddy, Dr. Russ Kronick, uh, professor at UTRGB, archeologist. Oh, yeah. he, he also had a, a stint at SEAC as well back in the day. Then we have the Fluxgate magnetometer. Uh, good class. I forgot this guy's name. Sorry. Uh, and this is my partner. Uh, <laughs> I forgot. That, what is his name? <laughs> He's from Midwest Arkansas. Steve DeVore. Stephen DeVore uh, from the Midwest Arkansas. Archaeological Center running the, that. He looks very comfortable, right? It's because you can't have any metal on your on your clothes, on your body uh, when you do this. So your butt, even your zipper, you can't have a metal zipper. Uh, so you got to wear like uh, sweatpants or whatever. And then this, the electric resistivity. You see, there's Robin again, student working out, I hope he, uh, out there. So we collect the data. This is the GPR data. Y'all can see the Ford in there, right? 
If anybody says right, I'll give him a point. <laughs> <laughs> you really can't. I can't because I've studied this and all. It's, it's over there. Uh, that was it. It wasn't. We really. Well, they found out because we tried to search for the road out here with a GPR earlier and did it. I come to find out. I come to the realization. GPR doesn't work in Cameron County on the thick clay deposit. It's just not that good of an instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, just that's just the way it goes. Sometimes some instruments don't work in places. So it wasn't that. This is the magnetometer data. <laughs> These are uh, utilities up there. But you can see, right? You can see the point of the star a little clearer in there. These are metal artifacts out there. But the electric receptivity. Unfortunately, we, like I said, we were counting on the GPR, so we kind of pulled the electric resistivity at the end, but we were able to finally get it. But man, isn't that clear? So with this information, we determined that there is subsurface integrity, even though the top part of the fort has been removed. And they, it, we lost it probably in the 1930s when they were building the first levees and it got pulled away as fair. And the only reason why this, and this represents the standing ruins right there, the only reason I think this was left in place is because that cannon tube was there. And oh. it was like a sacred marker that they didn't want to disturb or touch. Now, okay, I want, also want to say, Fort Brown was a military installation uh, from, from here to World War II. And what happens on military bases? They do, I worked at Fort Bliss and Fort Hood. They tear the hell out of them. <laughs> for exercise, they, re, they build new uh, ranges, and, and especially uh, Bliss or so, where it's, it's our artillery camp, right? Uh, later. Uh, Fort Bliss. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think they're Fort Sills, the big artillery. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but anyway, so we did, we were able to get more uh, electric resistivity. Uh, actually, HDR, a company that was doing the cultural resource. Uh, Compliance for uh, for the border wall, uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers, paid for one of the teachers to run the electric resistivity. It just looks a little different the way they displayed it on there the software. But like I said, these are the markers out there. This is what it looked like with a golf course. Uh, right now, it's it's kind of it's abandoned and it's sad because this is important, very important part of our history. And like I said, this war would lead to the U.S. Army occupying the Mexican capital and forever change the face of the North American continent. Let's go to the Civil War. Like I said, the thing about the Civil War, the federal, the Union, the Union Army had a very effective uh, naval blockade from, from Virginia down to the mouth of the Rio Grande. The only problem is the way this area is important. That's why, you know, I'll, what I'll say in a minute, this area was so important to the Confederacy because they could bring the cotton coming out of Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, down to Brownsville, cross it over to Mexico or, or up, to, up the valley, depending on who was in charge of Browns up the valley. Because we did switch hands a couple of times from federal, Fort Brown switched from federal to uh, Confederate and back in 1864, I think the summer of 1864, Confederate took it till the end of the war. But the cotton would come across and then uh, they would go on ships flying the Mexican flag and then in the, in the, Fed, the Union Army would not stop them because they didn't want to get another, another country engaged in their civil war. Uh, but this is part of uh, where King Kennedy and all those guys made a mass fortune. They started in, during the Mexican War with the steamboats because steamboats, you travel all the way up to Laredo in a steamboat up here. It was probably a, a long journey with all the, the bins and all that. But uh, that's where they got started. Uh, Richard King came down as a, as a captain, uh, started the U.S. Mexican War. They partnered with Charles Dolan. Anyway, um, this is a map from the period. 
out there just some of the highlights, the cities, the Russes. There's a small conflict out there. Now they're talking about Battle of Palmito Ranch is where was what I worked at. The summer I came down back down here in 2001, uh, I got involved with the survey. This is the commander. I should look at what the next slide is going to be for the federal troops uh, Theodore Barrett, which by this time from 1864, the federal troops had been uh, they had been stuck on Brazos Island out there, which is now Boca Chica Beach. They had been stuck out there because the, the Confederates had taken over and there would be pickets from Fort Brown all the way up to Tarpon Bend, or White Ranch, it was called White White Ranch at the time. And uh, little picket ground to Palmito Hill and all that. Um, I'm not sure if y'all know the, these landmarks I'm talking about. And this would be the commander of the Confederate forces, uh, Rip Ford. So, Palmito Ranch Battlefield was designated as a National Historic Landmark as recently as 1997. And I say National Historic, La National Historic Landmark carries a lot of weight. There's only like 2,500 National Historic Landmarks in the, in the country, <laughs> and they're highly protected under uh, the National Historic Preservation Act. But um, anyway, the reason why one of the big reasons why Palmito Ranch became, because me, as I'll show you right now, it wasn't a big battle, was it? It was fought on May the 11th through the 13th. A lot of people say after the war, Lee surrendered the Army of Virginia. The Confederate out west, the West Transmissive, the West Confederate did not surrender, in their opinion. You can correct me if I'm wrong, way or had anything, but they were still fighting. They didn't, they didn't, they had not surrendered. Um, but this battle did not change anything, but it's important, it is something, to me, I, I'm glad we're preserving it and studying it, <laughs> um, because it helps us to tell the story of the importance of the, the Lower Rio Grande Valley play during the Civil War, which was a cotton trade. You know. I got around myself. This is uh, part of the battle, like I said, it starts near the past, this is uh, Brazos Island, this was a depot up here that was started during the U.S. Mexican War. Both this whole area during the U.S. Mexican War and the Civil War had a lot of soldiers out there. Um, there's Camp Belknap on this loma here, which was a Mexican War uh, thing. It just um, so yeah, Taylor was inundated with over seventy thousand troops, seventy thousand volunteers. So they strung them out all the way from there, all over where they could uh, during that period. This is long running about. Essentially, it was a series of skirmishes. Um, the, let me see my, what the next map is. No, okay, no. Um, on the morning or the evening of the 11th, uh, they came over, the federal troops came over, engaged um, and removed the pickets over here at White Ranch and forced them, chased them all the way back here, and then they came back and stationed there. On the 12th, they had, they were like uh, tw 250 uh, troops. They got some reinforcements and they went and they chased the uh, Confederates out of, uh, out of, uh, this is uh, Palmito Hill out here in this area and where the core battle will be. And then on the afternoon of May 13th, Confederates came back with uh, 300 troops on the rip board on the mountain mainly and engaged the, the Federals right there, and then would chase them all the way back out there. Um, there was a hell of a lot of, of uh, there's a wide range of how this battle went. So I've heard hundreds, I think there were only about 10 people killed during the battle. It was, it was very light, fall back, it wasn't stuff, a uh, hard engagement um, out there. Uh, there are two books that are pretty good. Jeff Hunt and um, Thomas Tucker, I believe, is the other one. And they tell very different stories. These are recent books on there. Of course, there's a lot of older books on it, too. But like I said, the historic record, great, because it gives you a lot of information. But sometimes it gives you a lot of bogus information, too. Uh, and I'll tell you the difference with the archaeology. So, like I said, we came... Back, in 2001, I came back, I joined Charlie Hicker and Doug Scott. 
that we're doing an ABP grant uh, on this is Fish and Wildlife property, and we did all these survey transits right there. Um, we really <laughs> didn't find much at all. Uh, so after that, the next year I got permission to go on private land from Bobby Ledma, and we did this survey. John was definitely with me there. You were on this other one too, yeah. Let's see, you might hopefully have a picture of me. Uh, oh, that's just a map for the book showing the kind of same thing. Let me go back a second. Okay, yeah, so we did this like in 2002. And then this, okay, this right now is a Civil War Trust bought it at some point. And then they donated, they got tired of it because they, they weren't doing anything with it. They donated to the Texas Store Commission. Just last year, uh, the Texas Store Commission designated as a state historic site. So they're gonna start, they're gonna build a platform out there. They're gonna start doing some interpretation in conjunction with, with Fish and Wildlife on it. We don't own anything, but the National Park Service administers National Historic Landmarks. Uh, so we have a vested interest. So we, when I say administer, we just monitor them and watch them and make sure they aren't degrading or there are any impacts trying to stop them. Uh, but Fish and Wildlife owns a lot of the battlefields, so we've been working with them not only to study, but to help them interpret the battlefields. Uh, every, oh, almost, well, not every April, uh, we do a, a park day out there with the, with the Texas Historic Commission and Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the, the April of 2019, we did it at Fort Brown to kind of help bring attention to Fort, to the Fort. Uh, but this past year we did it at there and probably next year, especially because THC, THC gets the grant for the Civil War, I mean for the Battlefield Trust, and changed the name to the Battlefield Trust. Do it. But we did surveys back in 2010 with state archaeologist Jim Brusev and the military sites coordinator on those two, on those two fields. Uh, these are MPS folks. Actually, that's Forest Service, Chris Adams, Larry Ludwig, and, and Heather, Heather Young. Like I said, we didn't find a hell of a lot, but we did find parts for the battlefield. Battle-related artifacts are very few, including lead shot, buttons, Well, that's back to this thing. We did remote sensing, remote. We did remote sensing uh, with a, a GP, GPR and uh, and uh, then we did metal detector survey. Uh, Jim Brusev, state archaeologist with a shovel and uh, Bill Pearson uh, with a THC. All right, John, where you at? There's Robert again, right? <laughs> yeah. Is that Bob Johnson? No, the, it's fine. Fun? Okay. All right. You get, anybody want to guess what this is? I think that's the only picture I don't have. This is kind of, this is grooved right here. I found them in a lot of Civil War camps that I worked back east. I didn't know what it was when I first found it. It's part of a coffee grinder. <laughs> Which was important. Yeah. All the trips out. <laughs> okay, this is just a map showing the changes of the river. I guess I really didn't pay attention to too much to this last slide when I was getting this together. Um, this change of the river road. Uh, this is a feature that came out. We're looking to try and find the Telegraph Road. This is based upon that earlier historic map, kind of georeferent, trying to put it in, kind of eyeballing the base of the river. But this, I think, is the actual road. We found a trace of it out there. So. Like I said, we didn't find a lot of artifacts out there. Uh, that kind of goes to part of the, the record. It, it meshes with the, that when the Confederates came 
on the scene charging. Only the 45th Indiana Infantry left a picket line out there and then stayed. And, and we think we got it. The rest of the U.S. 62nd Colored Troops and the rest of the Union hightailed it out. And unfortunately, a lot of the 45th got trapped south here in this and uh, either trapped across the river or, or something. Um, I've heard story of human bones out there. I don't know, we, we didn't see anything, but we, we, we really didn't investigate that hard. It's still kind of reconnaissance level. But this is a pretty good scene of the picket line. This is good evidence for the picket line, which is back on that. Right there on this little loma, right there, which identifies the core battlefield. We got fire drop Confederate soldier. Uh, better it just makes sense good line there so cool we know we have it there this is the NHL of the movement like I said it was not a huge battle it didn't change the results of the war it did eventually uh, the Confederacy uh, maybe this is what maybe Wade you can help me out after May after these battles it just kind of went away <laughs> the the fight there was no more conflict out there they peacefully um, surrendered the, the state of Texas and, and the west of Texas as well. So as far as battle goes, it's not hugely important, it's not, but to me it's important. There is, or there was a lot, I never said this I think, in 97 because there was a lot of integrity of character, the landform, it hadn't changed. Unfortunately that's not the case anymore. Uh, the setting has been degraded. But it's still important to remember, and it gives us a place to, to uh, learn and study the role this area played in this in, in the Civil War. And this is going to be your favorite slide. <laughs> Thank y'all for your attention. It's, it's hard to go on so long, uh, but uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer. I'll give them to Wade to answer. <laughs> Nothing. Oh, we got sat here for an hour and a half. <laughs> All right, y'all feel free to get a pity one. I got some cool. I, I like this. This is my favorite, the NPS archaeology, and come to the archaeology fair in October. October the sixteenth is also a cool one. No dinosaurs because many people are confused. Archaeologists do not study dinosaurs as paleontologists. <laughs> I dig archaeology. Feel free to come here. There's some bookmarks up here too. Anyway, thank y'all so much for your attention and coming out. And I'm glad we didn't do it outside because that would have really sucked. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.